Hey, thanks for joining us today. We're in a new series called Quit Church because your life will be better if you did. I hope you enjoy it today. I'm not, I'm not encouraging you guys to quit church like altogether. What we're encouraging you guys to do is to quit the casual, comfortable, non-committal version of church that we've become accustomed to. I believe that culture has influenced us as people, just as influenced us as people so much. It, it is, culture has influenced us in our, the way that we do life, just the way that we live our life, the way that we interact as husbands or wives or the way that we are work, the way that, the way that we, in our relationship with God, it's affected that, and the way that we've actually had a relationship with the church. Culture has affected all of our relationships in every area. And last week, I kind of, I talked to you guys about the whole airport terminal and kind of made an analogy with that. I was thinking about another analogy. How many of you love In-N-Out? Any In-N-Out fans here? In-N-Out? How many of you know the secret menu at In-N-Out? Where are you at now? Secret menu In-N-Out. Okay. I, th- so the first time I, I heard about secret, men- secret menu, I thought my wife was lying to me. I thought she was playing like animal style. Like, what is, what's that? Like, you're kidding. And then out comes out of the window these animal style fries and my life was changed forever church and 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 a lot of people listen we approach um our relationship with god and church in a very casual way like a very superficial way where all we see is you know the 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 menu the in and out menu one two or three what do you want one uh, you know number one two or three and we come to church and Oh, love God, love each other, change the world. That's what it is. Love, let me get, I'll get a number one, God. And you don't know that there's like, there is so much more in your relationship with God that is available to you. There is so much more that God has in store for us as the body of Christ. And we're like stuck on the one, two, three menu. Just let me get a number two. There is so much more, you guys, that is available. But in order to access that, we have to know what to quit. And yeah, we quit a lot of stuff, but I don't think we're quitting the right things. Even people that are giving up on church, I think they're giving up on their version of church, not God's church. I don't even think that a lot of people are giving God's church a try. Here's what I said last week. And if you miss it, let me give you this challenge. Give God 12 months. Give God one year of your commitment, of of doing it His way, not your way, not your comfortable, casual, if it meets your timeline, it meets your schedule and all that type of stuff, then I'll do it and I'll say yes and I'll go to that. No, no, no. You adjust for Him. And you you, you be committed. Give, go all in for God for one year and just see what God will do. In order to win, we have to know what to quit. There, in, in, anything that you are going to be successful at, anything that you're going to win, you're gonna have, you have to quit some things in order to win. And, and so what we need to be is just not a church that knows how to win. You know, know, we know how to win, we know, what the, we know how to succeed, we know what the scriptures are, we hear the messages, but we need to be a church that knows how to quit. And we need to be a church that knows what to quit. Here's what the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, in your notes, you guys, it says this, let us throw off everything that hinders. Here's what the author of Hebrews is saying, hey, let's qu- we need to quit all that stuff. That's, that's tangling us up, that's hindering us as we, the sin that so easily entangles. I mean, you, so you know, you know what race you're running. You know, the, you know the end goal even. But a lot of you are still running with weights and tangles because it's not about knowing how to win or knowing what race you're, what track you're on. What it's about is not knowing how to quit those things that are tangling you up. He says, let's throw it off, let's quit it, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, the author and the finisher of our faith. Um, the, the, you just have to, you got to know what to throw off, you guys. You got to know what to quit. So in this series um, that we're doing, four installments, trying to show you what to quit. And I really hope that, that your relationships are going to be affected, that your relationships will be better because of this series, but really primarily that your relationship with God and your relationship with the body of Christ, his church, would be better because you know what to quit and you know how to quit. And and, and all of these are just cultural things that really has infiltrated our lives. Last week, I talked about how, how we need to quit waking up in heaven or trying to think that earth is going to be heaven. And if you miss that, you can catch that online. It's one of the best things that you can do for your faith is to have this understanding, this realization 
that heaven is a future place that I am going to, I'm heading to. It's a race. I'm running this race towards heaven, but it's not now. Like this is not, it's not going to fulfill all my expectations. I'm not going to get all my prayers answered. I'm not going to get all the happiness now. I'm not. I need to quit expecting earth to be heaven. I need to quit expecting the church to even be heaven because the church is full of broken people. And the only perfect person in church is who? It's Jesus. That's the only perfect person in church is Jesus. So we need to quit, wake, quit expecting earth to be heaven. It's never going to meet our expectation. Here's the, the second installment, what I think we need to quit that will really help your relationships with God, help your relationship with the church especially. Let me give you the scripture first. In the, in the very beginning, Genesis chapter 2, God set this, um, this, this precedence really of, of, of what our lives are supposed to be like. He created us very specifically and uniquely with certain needs, wants, desires. And here it says that the Lord God said, it is not good for man to be what? alone. He looked at creation. He said, it is not good for you to be a loner, for you to be alone, for you to be on your own, doing it yourself. And even in this, in this dark world, we talked about this, about like quit expecting earth to be heaven, because it's crazy almost to do that because earth is so jacked up. It's dark. It's messed up. It's, it's, there's, there's sin. It abounds. It's just destructive, chaotic, and we expect it to be heaven. And, but so why would we do that? But this is, I want to point out something to you. That this, God said this to us, and he said this to Adam and Eve when it was perfect, when it was good, when it was all good. God said, it's not good for man to be alone. It's still not good. So even if your life is going okay right now, and you think you're doing a pretty good job by yourself all alone, God, listen, God is saying it is not good. You might be thinking it's good. You're doing a good job. You're getting by okay. It is not good for man to be alone. We were created this way by God for community. In fact, it's kind of almost common knowledge now, at least for parents, that the, develop, the brain development of, of infants, of human beings for the first two years of their lives, um, most of the brain development happens at that first two years, okay? And this 20, 30 years ago, this, is, this was not something that a lot of people knew. It wasn't as common as it is now. But not only is the brain developing, listen, God did this. God made us this way. That we would have all this brain development in the first two years, but not only that, our social, emotional, and cognitive development is happening mostly in the first two years of our life, meaning that we as human beings are dependent upon our parents and the other adults in our life to give us love, care, nurturing, or else something is, something is off. It's, it, gets, it gets wired wrong and we see it and some of you have seen it in and kids depending on where you work my wife used to work in social services so she'd go to these different houses and even in the jameson center and she'd see the these kids who were just in very difficult situations that they were put into and very neglected and they just look at you different they just the it's just there something is missing nurture and care community is missing in this child in fact Years ago, my wife and I, when we were going to church in Oildale, I was on staff at a church there, and we were serving in the nursery, and I was the executive pastor, but every church we've been at, we've served in the nursery. Um, my wife and I, we love kids. I joke around. I, I, I joke around about I'm not called to be in the kids' ministry and stuff. I really am not. I can be nice to kids for a short burst of time, and I love them. I love them, and I'll make them. We have fun together, and then go back to your mama, okay? Get out of here. I mean, give me another batch, because I'm tired of you. You know what I'm saying? Um, <laughs> But anyway, it, but uh, we served in the kids ministry or in the nursery, and there was this this family that was a, they took on foster kids, and they took them from infant to you know, you know, uh, ten, eight, nine years years old. And uh, a lot of the kids that they took were just in tough circumstances. Some of it abuse, a lot of it neglect, um, abandonment, and you could just tell in in my interaction. And I like, to, I like to make kids laugh and enjoy. It just, there was, you could just tell, because God wired us. God wired us for community. That it is not good, he says, for man to be alone. You know, 445 times in the Bible, God says this word, tribe. God said, God, and he's repeating this 445 times, this word, he calls his people a tribe. You know, a tribe is a group of people with a common language and common beliefs. That we are 
We are called to, to serve one another and love one another and care for one another and support one another. God has called us to be a tribe, not just a congregation, but a, a tribe, a community he's called us to. So in this second installment of our Quit Church series, I want to encourage you to quit. Here's, write this down, to quit your church friends. Quit your church friends. Quit your silo relationships, your quote-unquote Church friends, I got my church friends, I got my work friends, I got my real friends, I got my these friends. And what you need to do is just quit your, the superficial relationship of, of church friends. It was never intended, God never intended it to be that way. You know, attending a church and belonging to a family, to the body of Christ, are two very separate things. Community, although there is power in Sundays, and I love the Sunday environment, and I'll talk to you about what happens even as the church gathers as one body, not just a cell, but as one body, what, what God does in the midst of that. I'll talk to you about that in a moment. But this, this thing about community, or even authentic community, we like to say here at Discovery Church, where it's real, it's vulnerable, it's, there's authenticity to the relationships it can't happen here on Sunday when you grab a donut and coffee, say your highs, go, jump in your car, God bless, love you, bye, and leave. That's not authentic community. That's, that can't happen in the 70 minutes that you give to your Sunday kind of flow and expression. There's got to be, you were made for more. You were made for more than that. God wired you different than to just have your Sunday 70 minutes and think that you, you, you're good. And, and really, again, this is cultural. This is cultural influ influence on, on our lives because we, we want to stay connected. We have this innate desire, every one of us, to stay connected but not too connected, right? That's why we all have, like, social media accounts, and we're connected to people, but we're not really connected to them. They don't know you. And even, even like, you're texting and stuff. Someone calls you, and you're like, why are you calling me? You could have texted me. Like, why? So we want to we, we connect with people, but you don't want to be too connected people. In, in fact, you even, you have this crazy desire to connect to people. You, you do it when you're not even supposed to be doing it. Like you do it at, at work when you're on the clock or you do it in the car. You're texting people and driving. Come on, don't lie. You know you do it. Or you talk on the phone and drive and stuff. How many of you have, have ever been talking to someone on the phone when they're driving and then, and then you hear them go, wait a minute, and throw the phone? <laughs> how, how, what happened? A cop drove by or they saw a cop, right? You know, because we why do we do this? Because we want to be connected, but not too connected. We want to talk to people, but not with people. We want to have church friends, but not genuine friends that go to a deeper level. And honestly, if you want to experience the life that God has called us to, and within even the body of Christ, you guys, you got to quit these silos of church friends. And it's a trap that all of us fall into because of culture's influence on our life. And really, there are some very real barriers and roadblocks for every single one of us to doing that, to experiencing authentic community. And I want to just maybe expose them with you because all of us deal with these same roadblocks because all of us live in the same culture, okay? And we have these same, a lot of these same experiences. So once you take some notes with me, you guys, you, you may experience some of these roadblocks or maybe even all of these roadblocks are maybe preventing you from experiencing the authentic community that God has called you to. Write some notes, you guys. Here's the first one, and this is like every single one of us have relational wounds. Every one of us have been hurt by people. We have relational wounds, and they come in, in every sphere of life. We have, we have relational wounds that are like church, or, uh, work wounds, right? You have work wounds. You have family wounds. You have family hurts, and, and you even have their church hurts. I mean, you know what I'm talking about, church hurts, and it's so sad, even as a pastor, I hear the craziest stories of how people have been hurt, and, and, and it's kind of, it's even, to me, it's like tough in the church, because this is the place where you, you've even been encouraged to be vulnerable, and, and to have community, and then something happens where maybe, maybe in your workplace, or in other relationships, or it could even be the church, where it just wasn't reciprocated, where maybe someone you know, they, they stabbed you in the back or they turned their back on you or, or when they were supposed to be there for you, you thought they were going to be there for you and they didn't show up in your life like you thought they were, were going to show up. And, and it just, and so there are. There, these are very real, it's a very real barrier for us to experience authentic community because we want to put up a wall now. 
We don't want to let people in and experience that hurt again. So we protect ourselves from ever even getting to that place of allowing people to hurt us. Here's two things I want you to know. If that's you, if you're in this boat of it's a bit, just these wounds and hurts that we've experienced, and you're allowing it to be a barrier to let people into a place of authenticity where, where they know you deeply and intimately. First thing I want you to know is that Jesus knows you're hurt. And I don't mean that as a cliche. I know it is a cliche like God knows. And, but he, hey, listen, he does. He knows your hurt and your pain. Jesus knows relational wounds. He had a group of 12 people. We call them the 12 apostles, these 12 disciples. He had a group. There were 12 of them. Two of his friends turned their back on him and hurt him at his weakest moment. One of them, you guys know Judas. Judas one of his 12, you guys, handed him over to be beaten and killed. Okay? And then, and then one of his, Peter, someone who was in the inner, inner circle, who was clo- one of the closest friends in Jesus' life, denied him three times on his most difficult day of his life. The day that a friend is supposed to show up and have your back, Peter didn't. So God, look, Jesus knows about church hurt. He knows about relational wounds. But here, the second thing I want you to know about this is you got to find a way to get past your past. You have to find a way to quit being wounded. Quit being hurt. Hey, quit being offended. Quit being hurt because you're allowing it to hurt your future. You got to know what to quit, church. You have to quit in order to win. And some of you, you need to quit being wounded. Jesus knows and you got to get past that. Philippians says it this way, Paul, the writer of Philippians, he says, brothers and sisters, I don't consider myself to have taken hold of it. And he's talking about, you know, like perfection. Like he's, he's saying, look, I'm not perfect yet and fully, fully perfected. I know I'm not and neither is everybody else. So I do this one thing. I forget what is behind. All right. I, I quit allowing those things that are behind me to affect me in my future because I'm running a race. I'm straining on toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Some of you guys need to quit being hurt, quit being offended, because it's, it's, it's a barrier for you experiencing the authentic community that you were created for. Here's the second barrier, and this is, for some of you, your personality your personality. Like, for some of you, that's just a barrier of you experiencing authentic community, because we're all just created differently. Some of you are introverts and extroverts. Some of you are more serious, uh, more pensive, more cautious, and, and, and maybe you even get mistaken for negativity, you know, because you're so cautious, and you diagnose situations and people, and, and, and it's just harder for you to connect. Listen, that does not, your personality does not excuse you from experiencing authentic community. It just means you need to try a little bit harder. You do, and I get it, but it is a barrier. For some of us, it's a barrier. And, and extroverts, you don't, get, you don't get off easy either, okay? I'm not going to let you off easy because extroverts like to have a lot of people that, that are, they're friends with, but no one who's deep and really knows their issues, okay? But this is, for, for some of you, this may be a barrier, okay, that you just kind of, uh, you're, per, you're allowing your personality to let you be isolated from people. And this is what the Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 18, verse 1, has to say about being isolated. Whoever isolates himself seeks his own desire. Like, like you're putting your desires and your, you know, your preference over God's will. You know he's created you for community. He breaks out against all sound judgment. Like, you know that. You know that God has designed you this way to do life together, yet you continue to isolate yourself, and you're breaking out against God's will for your life. you got to quit that, church. <laughs> You got to quit so you can win here. Here's the next barrier, and that's our perspective. Our perspective. Some of us just have the wrong, like, lens that we see authentic community. The way that we do authentic community here at Discovery, by the way, is in our groups. And some people have this, like, wrong mindset of what authentic community looks like or even what small groups look like. So, So some people think, like, I don't have a need for that. I don't want that or need that. I've already been to church. You know, I've already been to church once. I don't, need, I don't need to do it again. Or they think like groups and community are awkward. That's another one. Like when I, if I it's just awkward getting to know new people. And what is going to happen? I go into that house or go to that home. They're all going to be sitting around candles, sharing their feelings and stuff. That is awkward. I don't want to do that, okay? And so, but we let our perspective of authentic community, of what that looks like or the need of it, you're letting your perspective prevent you from, from experiencing God's will for your life. 
When Romans chapter 12 says, for just as each one of us has one body with many members, and these members don't all have the same function. So you have a hand that's different from your elbow, and you got your, 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 your knee is different from your thigh. It's just they're, they're, they're different. But so in Christ, we are many. We are many. We form one body, the body of Christ, and each member will, uh, what, what? belongs to each other. You belong connected to the body of Christ. And maybe, though, it's a barrier for you because maybe your perspective is one of like, you don't need it, you don't want it, it's too weird, whatever it is. Maybe that's a barrier for you, though, the way that you perceive this authentic community or group life. Here's the last one, and this, again, is all of us. All of us is this one in our culture. Busyness. Busyness. I'm just too busy. I'm just, I don't know how many times I've, I've heard that. And I get it, man, because we got work, you got school, you got uh, you got hobbies, you got kids, you got your spouse, you got, you got so much stuff. I don't know if I can fit one more night, you know, for authentic community. You know, just one more night to get some friends and do a group. And I don't know if I, look, let me challenge you with this thought. Because I get it, I get it. I'm busy too. I get busy, okay? Let me challenge you with this thought though. If you're really too busy for this, then you're too busy. Okay? Okay, listen, if you are too busy... And things are pulling you away from God's divine plan for your life, then you are too busy. Your priorities need to be adjusted and your lifestyle needs to be changed to fit God's plan, not the other way around. So if you are too busy to experience authentic community, then you are too busy and something has got to change in your life. Okay, are you seeing this? Okay, so that excuse. We've allowed it to be an excuse. I'm just busy. I'm just busy. Really? Because Jesus said this in John chapter 14. He said, if you love me, then show it by doing what I've told you to do. Then show it. I mean, I I believe that if we were to try to tell Jesus, like, oh, oh, Jesus, I was just, I don't, I'm busy. He'd say, okay, I get it. But do you love me? How about my personality? I don't just, it's awkward and I don't, I don't know. It's my... Okay, I get it. I get it. But do you love me? Do, do you love me? Because if you, if you do, then, then adjust your priorities to fit my plan for your life. Do you love me is all he would say. Then, then do what I've told you. But we get busy, and we're working and toiling and sweating, and we're trying to build our kingdom. We're trying to meet our goals and, and, and make, yeah, we're making heaven, earth. Psalm 127 says this, says, unless the Lord builds the house, its builders build in vain. They labor in vain. And unless the Lord protects the city, its watchmen stand guard in vain. I get it. You got to work. I got to work. We got to work for our families. Got to build our house. We gotta, we're going to protect our family and be protectors. But unless the Lord builds that house, unless the Lord protects that house, it's in all in vain. It's all in vain. In vain, you rise early and stay up late toiling for bread to eat for the for a home a roof over your head for a car a nice family car to drive for a vacation every year for you just toiling if the lord is not building that house it's just busyness and god has created you for community he's created you for so much more see god just doesn't want you to attend god wants you to belong god didn't just he didn't create you to just attend a church. God created you to belong. We work hard all day, labor night and day, week after week, month after month, and we're building, we're building our houses, but we're not using God's blueprint. And that's a problem, you guys. And I've spoken to a lot of people who don't attend church anymore because they didn't get anything out of it, or they, can't, they don't connect with the people. Is it possible that we're doing it wrong? I mean, is it, is it, could it be that you need to quit your church friends and build some authentic community outside of your Sunday 70 minutes? Could it be? Let me show you the model of the early church. In Acts chapter 2, the early church had this model of just meeting for worship, but also meeting together in authentic community. I want to show it to you in Acts chapter 2, verse 42 through 47. 
It says that they, this early church, they devoted themselves. And, it, and if you want to know what that looks like to be a fully devoted follower of Christ, and by the way, everything that follows, the signs and the wonders and the miracles that follow was because of this, because they were fully devoted followers of Christ. If you are wondering what that looks like, a couple of weeks ago I did a message called A Heart for the House and kind of shared what, what does it look like to be a fully devoted follower of Christ, loving God, loving each other, and changing the world. You can go check that out if you want to know what it looks like to be fully devoted. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to breaking bread and in prayer. So they had these different spheres. They met large. They met in groups. They met in fellowship and prayer. And it continues. Everyone was filled with awe. And because of that, many wonders and signs were performed by the apostles. And all the believers were together and they had everything in common, so they had unity and community, and they sold. They were generous to anyone who had need. They broke bread, it continues, they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And I love this, and it says, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Isn't that exciting, man? I think the church should be the most exciting entity on earth, and it really is. You know why God wants to see the church grow because he loves everybody. He wants to see everybody saved. He wants everybody to experience um, a, a home in heaven with him. I, I read this a couple weeks ago, Luke chapter 14, verse 23. says, go out into the country and urge anyone you find to come in so that my house will be what? My house will be full. God wants his house Full, but there's some look, there's something that happens when, when we dwell together in unity. Some people I've heard say this, maybe you've say that, said this before, but I've heard people say, Hey, I like small church. I like small churches. You know, have you ever heard that before? I like small churches, and I get it. Like, we're we've gone through growth stages in the last five years like crazy, but we've had smaller buildings, so we keep it small and it feels kind of small to still, but um. You know what I found that most of the time when people are saying I like small churches, and I don't mean to like hurt any feelings or ruffle any feathers. If it's not you, it's not you. But I mean, a lot of times I see, I see this happening without people's knowledge. When they say I want a small church or I like a small church, what they're really saying is I, I like to go to a church where everybody knows my name on Sunday but doesn't know my secrets throughout the week. All right, and that's, and, and, and look, that, Oh, I didn't, I didn't get to know anyone. I didn't get to anyone's name on Sunday. I didn't get to meet any new people. Look, that's not the goal of Sunday. Sunday's goal is not, Sunday's goal is big. God wants his house to be full. God wants to reach the lost sons and daughters that are out here in our community. And the, that's not the goal of Sunday. The goal of Sunday is just to gather as a tribe under one vision, language, and belief and see the signs, wonders, and miracles that happen when God's people dwell together in unity. That's the goal of Sunday. When we come in and we, wanna, we want a, a different kind of flow. There's an important concept about this church, this early church in Acts that was developed th that brought the signs and wonders and miracles, you guys. It, even I believe it, it, it's the reason why the growth in the church happened the way it did. You see, God wants the church to do two things. Two things. And they seem like opposite things. God wants the church to grow larger and smaller at the same time. He does. God wants all people to be saved and come to repentance to know His Son, Jesus Christ, as their Lord and Savior. But He also wants, He's not good for us to be alone, and He wants us in authentic community. There's no way you can be in authentic community in a Sunday flow. Like, even if the church was 75, 100 people, okay, you cannot be in authentic community and deeply, intimately known by 100 people. There's just no way. Jesus had 12 people that He did life with, but God wants the church to grow larger and smaller at the same time. So how do we do that? How do we, how do we grow larger and smaller? Well, through authentic community. That's how. At Discovery, we call them small groups. So let me give you the truth about authentic community. I want to give you the things that are, that, that authentic community, the way God wired you, he wired you to experience some things in authentic community that you cannot get otherwise. You, you, just, you just can't. You, you will never be full, complete, a healthy disciple of Jesus Christ without authentic 
community, without maybe experiencing groups here at Discovery where that kind of happens at a table or on a couch or over food or fellowship or whatnot. It's just, there's some truths you need to know about authentic community. Write them down, you guys. Here's number one. Number one, it's a place where you can grow. Authentic community is a place where you can grow. And this is another cultural thing. Like in our culture, we believe that if I grow intellectually, that means I'm growing spiritually. If I have more information, then that means I'm stronger. I'm a stronger Christian now. And that, in, look, growing intellectually does not always transfer to growing spiritually, does it? No, there's a lot of people who know a lot of information, have heard a lot of sermons, read a lot of books, but they're not spiritually mature. Why is that? It should, it, it should transfer, and it can transfer, but in, say like even in this environment, you can get in, there's impartation and revelation can happen. But if, if, if it does not transfer out there to application, it will not become transformation. Revelation, application, transformation. If it stops at revelation and you don't go out there and apply it to your life and relationship, it just becomes information. It's just inf more information for you, but it will never change your life until you can get into authentic community. It's the place where you can grow. God wired you this way. And I'm not talking about just growing intellectually, growing in your knowledge or having more information. I'm talking about growing in your character, in your faith, in your spirit. Look what Proverbs says. Proverbs says it clearly. As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. That's how you get sharpened. That, that's how you, you get your cutting edge. That's how you get more effective is by iron sharpening iron. It's through these relationships that we have that we are actually grow. It's the place where you will grow. And some of you need it. Some of you don't know why you maybe aren't. It's not manifesting what you know isn't manifesting in your life and in your relationships. Well, it could be this. It could be because you're not experiencing authentic community. And you were made for that. It's the place where you grow. Hey, guys, the, the church does not start and end on Sunday. You do know, know that, right? All right, this, isn't, this, isn't, this is a part of it, yes. But there is so much more than give me a number one, two, or three to God and to church. There is so much more that you're missing out on. And you got to quit that, church. we got to quit that so we can win. Here's the second thing, the truth about authentic community, and that is that it's a place where you can heal. It's a place where you can heal. Again, culture's influence. How many ever heard or maybe even said, me and God are okay, though? I haven't been around, but I still read in my Bible, Pastor. Okay? It, it, again, we th like, okay, good, good for you. Like, you got, you're getting Bible and stuff like that. That's great. But if you're not going to experience this thing called authentic community, then not only are you not going to grow, to where, how and where God wants you to grow, but there is actually some healing that is held up because you're not an authentic community. There are things that, absolutely, I mean, just, I've experienced God's miracle hand just in my room praying, okay? So there are some things that, absolutely, God can do in a moment, just you and God. But there are some things that God withholds from your life. There's possibly some things that you are still not whole from, because you have not become vulnerable in authentic community. James chapter 5, verse 16. Therefore, confess that stuff. Not just the cot. Not, oh, I, I confess it. No, no, no. Confess your sins to who? One another. Let, let them know. Let someone know the issue, the hurt, the, and pray for one another so that you may be what? Healed. There is healing for you between, that's held up, like it's, it's held up in between heaven and earth, like it is yours, it's yours, it's already like done, but until you experience this thing called authentic community, and until you start walking vulnerable with another person, and where you can go a little bit dip, deeper in not just church friends, but genuine friends, will you experience the healing that God has for you? Because the prayer of the righteous person has great power as it's working. Hey, authentic community is the place where you're going to grow. All right? It's the place where you're going to heal. And then number three, it's the place where everybody knows your name. Right? Everybody, come on. Everybody see Cheers? Cheers. There's a reason why Cheers is so popular, was so popular back in the 70s. There's a reason why Friends is so popular in the, what was it, 80s, 90s? 
There you go. There's a reason why some millennials, new girl, new girl. There's a reason why new girl is so popular. It's be, we're attracted to community. We are. This, this idea of, of everybody knowing our name. There's, there's even studies about this, about when someone says your name and what it does to a person to hear their name in somebody else's mouth. Look, in this place, like in this, in this Sunday thing, ain't, everybody's not going to know your name. But this ain't the place for everybody to know your name. But you do need a place where you are known. Where you are known, when they know you, you, you know them. An authentic community is that place where you can be known. Let me, let me leave you with a little bit of wisdom lit- literature from Solomon. Ecclesiastes, he writes in chapter 4, two are better than one. Two, look, and I hope you receive this. Some of you here today, you're doing a great job. You're doing a good job. You're doing it good. You're a good Christian. You do good, you're doing, like you, you read your Bible, man, you're a good, you're a good, good job, Christian. Some of you are doing good job, good, can I tell you, good job. You're doing good by yourself, good for you. But two are better than you. I'm just, this is, this is God's will for your life. And I know you think you're okay, and you can do it by yourself, but you are, there is so much growth that is not happening in your life. Yeah, you're doing good. Hey, good job. But there is so much more to your relationship with God and your relationship with the body of Christ that you don't even know because you're not in authentic community. There is even healing in your life that you don't even know exists or that you could experience because you're alone. But two are better than one, God says, because they have a good reward. They have a better return for their labor. You were created for community. I want you to know that. You were created for this, church. You were designed by God for this. Here's another Ecclesiastes chapter 4, wisdom literature here, Solomon. And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. See, you're not meant to experience the brokenness of this life that maybe we've experienced because we're traveling alone brokenness of relationships brokenness of dreams just brokenness man and god's like if you just if you just would get yourself in in a tribe if you just get yourself in some authentic community there's so much growth healing power that is available to you it's we got to quit the church friends you guys the silo relationships the passing by relationships develop some genuine friendships or let me say it this way quit attending and start belonging that's what you were made for you were made by God to belong not just go to church or attend church but be the church hey thanks for joining in for our quit church series we hope you enjoyed it make sure you come back for the next installment in this series